Inside Outside Innovation is the podcast that brings you the best and the brightest in the world of startups and innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger, founder of InsideOutside.io, a provider of research, events, and consulting services that help innovators and entrepreneurs build better products, launch new ideas, and compete in a world of change and disruption. Each week, we'll give you a front row seat to the latest thinking, tools, tactics, and trends in collaborative innovation. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. I'm your host, Brian Ardinger. And as always, we have another amazing guest with me today is Kathleen Cohen. Kathleen is the founder of The Collaboratorium. Kathleen, welcome to the show. Hi. I am excited to have you on the show for a couple of different reasons. One, it's always nice to talk to people that have been in the innovation space for a long time and can give a perspective on all that. Secondly, you're coming out to the IO Summit in October here. And so I'm excited to tease a little bit about what you're going to be talking about and get folks excited about coming out to Nebraska. Welcome to the show again. Thank you so much. I uh, love the idea. I have not been to Lincoln, Nebraska. That's often the case, but I'm sure you'll come back. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, let's start off with some of the basics. So for our audience, some of your background, you've done a lot of work in product development. You've worked at some amazing companies like DreamWorks and Disney Resorts and IBM, and you've been in the space for a long time focused on innovation and product development and that. Let's give the audience a little bit of background of how you got into innovation and how that journey has evolved. In my talk, I'll show a slide that visually maps this out, but sort of the high level is, you know, I came out of college as a classical antiquity painter. And back then it was medical illustration would be the only job you'd get paid for if you were going to go down that path. And that wasn't as intriguing to me as maybe moving to New Orleans and painting big scale murals for Jazz Fest and Mardi Gras. And that was super exciting. So I did that and then wanted to be more tactile. So I went into industrial design and I wanted to focus on glass. And maybe I thought I'd be a glass architect. And my life, I was happy. I was happy as a glass blower, working on potentially doing glass architecture. And then a friend of mine called me and said, uh, I was in the Bay Area at this point and had studied with Dale Chihuly School, Pilchuck and Harvey Littleson School in Asheville. And my friend called me from LA and said, you got to get on the box, like stop with the barefoot glass blowing. I don't even know what you're doing. And uh, I said, what, is that, what does that mean, get on the box? So that's where my life in 1994, 95 started with SGI, learning animation, Silicon Studios, which was in Santa Monica, and that was part of Silicon Graphics. And from 1994, 95 to today, it's been one big evolution of touching every platform in digital and starting as a creative and sort of ending as an executive. And everything in between. That's pretty crazy. I know you do a lot of speaking and you've been, again, talking about this evolution of innovation. So what are some of the biggest things that you've seen of how people innovate and how people are using different tools and techniques? What are the biggest changes that you've seen over the last 15, 20 years? You know, the obvious most current shift is I'm so thrilled to have witnessed and walked through being somebody who's been an artist in physical space who has spent 20 plus years inside a screen to now break through a screen and come back 360 into a physical space again. So to me, that's the most obvious. And then the data layover on top of that with data, big data to now AI and machine learning is the second biggest part of Mm. this innovation. I think that combination is, it's a double or triple threat the way you look at it, but. Have you seen the way innovation has been conducted or thought about evolve because of the tools changing and because of the new software and the new technology? Has that helped drive innovation or change the way people do innovation? What's your thoughts on that? It's funny. I think I've had the good fortune of starting in the industry as the industry began, not just from entertainment, because we often push on everybody else on every other vertical, but calling myself a digital strategist at a time now where I call myself an experiential strategist is really reflective of innovation. Innovation used to be how do we innovate from design strategies that were more linear and 2D and now experientially, how do we innovate? And that's Hmm. a big shift. It's what I think about all the time. How much of that has been like influenced by companies like you work for Disney Resort? So I always think of those Mm -hmm. folks as folks that kind of got that experiential part earlier in the game than a lot of the other folks. So maybe tell us a little bit about your career there or or some of the case studies? Yeah. or One of the things that I feel really proud of, and I didn't ride the ride, I wish I had, but I chose to move on and open my own consultancy when this had happened. But I came aboard Disney to launch DisneyWorld.com, which was in dire need of support from 
senior producer's lens. And I had come from IBM Innovation, so I really was short up on how to take that on time and under budget and work super efficient. Disney is so funny. They want more magic, more magic. Kathleen, can you put more magic into the website? And I was like, I don't know what they mean by more magic. I've done more magic a hundred ways here. And at the end of the day, it was like, can you just put more Tinkerbell dust on the website? I'm like, you're kidding. That's what we're talking about is more magic. But that's not what I was going to talk about. After we launched and we were on time, under budget, everything was glory. They invited a creative team together to start thinking about how to re-architect EBCOT with new technology. So the Worldwide Parks and Resorts online team was very different than the Imagineering team, where Imagineering would have naturally owned re-architecting EBCOT. Mm -hmm. But the Parks and Resorts team, you know, where there are a lot of us were former gamers, we had also been in digital in a very immersive way. And the thought leadership in our group, they cherry picked a lot of creatives to think about how to re-architect EBCOT, which ultimately led to the Magic Band. So in 2004, the question was asked, how do we re-architect this? And in 2013, the first beta was launched on the Magic Band. So for nine years, it went through an incredible design challenge with many folks and teams putting their stake into it. But when you look at Disney's billion-dollar infrastructure and commitment to wanting to have a better relationship with their guests, you know, everybody looks at this from the theme park world, and that's the holy grail. But nobody has that bank account in order to do the same thing. But if you could promise, the promise was to any mother, let's say, most mothers of households are planning the trip to Disney World, the promise was for an hour investment of your time in us, we will personalize your entire experience where it's seamless if you use this device with hmm. four RFID ID chips and one near-field communication device in it. It'll be your fast pass, your room key, your reservation system. It'll be your GPS tracker, your personalized experience with any characters in the park if your kid is having a birthday. So that alone was revolutionary in looking at Disney change its experience from linear and online, breaking through the screen into the park. And now after nine years of collecting data and beta testing in 13, so really six years, in 13 it went beta. So for six years, it's been collecting data. And now we can storytell with that. Right. And that's a phenomenal new shift in this idea of innovation. Hey listeners, I wanted to pause this episode to bring you a special announcement. We are bringing back the IO Summit. Yes, the third annual Inside Outside Innovation Summit is coming October 20th through the 22nd. This year's theme is talent, technology, and the future of innovation. If you are an entrepreneur, innovator, corporate leader, looking to future-proof your organization, showcase your startup, or just mix and mingle with some of the best and the brightest in the world of innovation, don't miss this immersive event, October 20th through 22nd. Check out tickets at theiosummit.com. I like how they took a kind of holistic approach to innovation. A lot of times we hear the word innovation, we think technology, or we think just software. But, you know, the ability to tie in software and hardware and data and the experience itself and, and how that all comes together, I really do think that's where the world's going. And obviously, Disney is one of those leaders in it. Maybe through your work with the Collaboratoria or other folks, what kind of trends or companies are you seeing that are leading the edge or adapting to that new experiential workforce or experiential environment? I mean, it's hard not to address any company that's not looking at spatial web and spatial web computing and people that are looking at the metaverse and world building. That's the area I live in. So obviously Magic Leap taking their focus off of their Magic Leap one mixed reality goggles and focusing on their Magic Verse, their equivalent to the metaverse, which is mm -hmm. part of my talk, is to me the next 25 years of development. You know, at what point are we all really going to live in this metaverse and how real is that going to be? That's one question, but the architecture, the thought leadership, the questions that we have to ask in urban planning, not from a gamer's lens and world building, but in urban planning, what does that mean? Are we going to fix systemic world problems with it? What questions are we asking? To me, that's where a lot of my interest is, is those companies looking at world building and metaverse building. We were talking before we got on, on the recording, how your role in life has kind of changed from more product focused or the technology side of things to be, you're now known as this humanist and this evolution. So maybe talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, who knew? This all stems back to when I was 14. I got dragged into a human potential workshop. I thought, why is everybody yelling at everybody in here? I didn't understand. You know, years later, I looked back and I thought, oh, they were really working through things. Okay. So, (laughs) you know, how do I use that to inform what I do today? This talk, Meeting Your Digital Twin, started from a talk I gave last year multiple times around the future is overrated compared to human ingenuity. And regardless of me being at Burning Man 13 times, not this year, sadly, looking at the most creative, most ingenuity, and who are the folks that are leading that, and where is the human potential there? And so meeting your digital twin was born out of, if I were to look at a human being and look at all your digital trails and capture you volumetrically, what would you look like? And would you look any different than what your data says about you? And Mm. that's where this sort of started to evolve. And from that, I started creating what I thought was the beginnings of the five personas of you. And one persona, of course, is all this data that's collected about you. Another persona is the social media you put out about yourself. So really the behavioral psychology about yourself. Persona three is my perception of your social that you put out because I know you and that's not necessarily what I believe to be about you. So it's the perceptual reality of the social. And then, of course, you're 23 and me actual DNA and that data that's collected about you, including your oral history, what's been passed down to you, what you know about yourself. If these four characters were all captured on a light stage, what would they look like? Who would that be? Who would you be as a digital twin of yourself? I even forgot the question you just asked me, but that's where all this evolved from. (laughs) Well, I mean, this idea of this movement to become more of a humanist and looking beyond the technology or along the product and things like that. I think you've captured it well from the standpoint of, it is interesting how we are all blending technology and people and the mushy uh, fluffiness of folks, as well as the tactical scientific sides of things. And it'll be interesting to see how that evolves in the future. Are you seeing companies embrace that? Or what are the things are are you seeing from the corporate innovation side? I am from a lot of the equivalent to sort of the ACLUs of AI, the Algorithmic Justice League, a lot of these data and society, a lot of these folks that are really questioning where AI is fitting into all of this is forcing the hand of where is agency for us over our identity? Obviously with deep fakes and everything else, where is our identity? Who are we? What is rightfully mine? Who am I? All these life human questions are being asked because we're getting pushed into this territory where I share this in my talk between now and 2045, we're in the development years of all of this. We're just trying to figure it out and trying to have a shared grammar around this. I do think from the corporate side, certainly digital rights, digital citizenship, digital sovereignty, those are the ways into the conversation around where AI and the ability to recreate virtual humans is merging. And I Mm -hmm. think there is a very humanistic need to look at the sociologists, the anthropologists, the behavioral psychologists, and ask them to be paired with, and I say this in my talk, um, to be paired with every AI engineer. That's shortly going to be a must for corporations. Yeah, that collaborative nature. The last kind of core topic I want to talk about is you've had a chance to interact with some of the most creative people on the planet and innovators in, in a variety of different skill sets and a variety of different industries and that. Are there commonalities or things that people should be thinking about for this new world of work? common characteristics or common traits that people should be either enhancing or building on to become better innovators? Yeah, I just recently spoke at the Gray Area Festival in San Francisco, which is a terrific group of innovators from the artist perspective, less on the corporate side, more on the grassroots community and artist perspective. And I will always lean towards that being my community because it feels like there's a humanity built in rather than Silicon Valley being data-driven, exit-planned ROIs and how much money, where Hollywood is looking at storytelling and narrative and how much money. And those two worlds, Northern and Southern California, are trying to meet somewhere in the middle because Silicon Valley needs more storytelling and Hollywood wants to be more data-driven. So while all of that is happening, the artists, the makers, the folks that are really true to their spirit is where I see there's a big need for that. 
you know, in both camps, there's a big need for that. And I keep seeing it being recognized more than I ever have, which is really kind of beautiful. Asking the real simple questions on wanting to collaborate, wanting open source, wanting to share resources, everything that maybe academia offers that is always an ROI issue for mm -hmm. corporate. I think there's an awareness happening and a blend happening. You know, Silicon Valley is trying to chase the new chase what's different while everybody's microdosing out there everybody's trying to figure out you know how to get back to uh something that seems so core and i see it in hollywood too and while we're re-blueprinting humanity right now with all of the virtual human conversations it's kind of nice i'm seeing it and i don't know if that's just the wisdom of being around so long i don't know if 20 year olds are seeing it or 30 year olds are seeing it in their workforce because they're in it but i'm seeing it from my lens I don't know if it's just me and where I'm at and what I'm attracting and what I'm finding or if it's really happening. Well, I love the conversation. I think there are pockets of things that are popping up all over that are resonating in different formats and that. So I'm excited to bring you out to Nebraska here for the IO Summit coming up in a few weeks. If you yes. can find out about yourself or connect with you prior to coming out to the conference, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, you can just directly email me at Casey at the com. And I'm happy to follow up with anybody that wants to reach out. Excellent. Well, Kathleen, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks and uh, look forward to continuing this conversation about what's next in the world of innovation. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for including me in the community. I'm super excited to meet you and the folks in Nebraska. That's it for another episode of Inside Outside Innovation. If you want to learn more about our team, our content, our services, check out insideoutside.io or follow us on Twitter at the IO Podcast or at Artinger. Until next time, go out and innovate.